He's, uh, as most of you uh, know, a specialist in post-World War II Europe. Uh, I think that uh, his, uh, his presentation today has very, very uh, great pertinence considering some of the things that are happening in the world today. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Adam Seip. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored uh, to be here today to have gotten this, this invitation and to have the opportunity to speak to uh, an audience that uh, is much larger than I was warned to expect. So thank you for taking part of a snowy day to come out and, and hear this. Um, I particularly want to thank uh, the uh, Office of the Historian of the Secretary of Defense, uh, Aaron Mahan, Tom Christensen, and uh, Jonathan Chavon, who's sitting here in front of me. As Tom just indicated, uh, Texas A&M is, is deeply privileged and honored to be part of a, a multi-year internship opportunity for our PhD students uh, to come here uh, to work in the history office. Um, and I will take this opportunity to just briefly plug this program because I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, as, as those of you who uh, perhaps know something about uh, the American academic job market or the American Academy these days, uh, job positions for PhD historians are uh, a vanishing breed. And it is, it's, it's our mission as people who train historians to make sure that young historians in this country have as many opportunities and realize all of the different ways that a PhD in history can be used. And I, I want to thank uh, the Office of the Historian for, for its hard work and for its diligence uh, and for making this possible. This is, this is really something terrific. But I'm here today to talk about something that's uh, quite dear to my heart and, and dear to the research that I do. And that is the American occupation of Germany in the years following the devastation of the Second World War. I would point to my book. Uh, I can assure you many quality copies are still available. Um, <laughs> and I will happily sign any copy that has been lawfully purchased. Um, uh, but um, this is something I've spent uh, a number of the past few years thinking about and something that I anticipate continuing to think about in days to come. If the first slide, please. Don't worry, I will keep the PowerPoints to a minimum. Um, I want to start my talk today by talking about the day that the village of Oberiedenburg exploded. Oberiedenburg, well, it was. It doesn't exist anymore. This is a story that I discovered when I first started traveling through, I'll just wait for a moment, a little chunk of northern Bavaria, district of Lower Franconia, an area I came to know well while I was working on this book. And I noticed that there was a town called Unterriedenburg, but there was no Oberriedenburg. So I asked, and I was told there was a fire. And then years later, when I was sitting in the National Archives in Washington, the story of what happened to Oberriedenburg became far more clear. On July 27th, 1945, a train loaded with munitions seized at the German munitions plant in the tiny Franconian village of Wildflecken, was waiting in Oberriedenburg for clearance to head south where it would join the main train line connecting Würzburg and Schweinfurt. 63 cars of munitions parked in a town, stopped at a town of a few dozen souls, about 10 houses, a few barns. What happened next is somewhat unclear. There was an explosion. There was a fire. The townspeople were warned to get away, at which point there was a much larger explosion, at the end of which there was really nothing left of the community. Nine homes, 12 barns, 300 feet of track destroyed. The local military government commander, a major named Thomas Clark, launched what could only be described as a desultory investigation, something that is captured in a set of files in an obscure corner of the National Archives. There were two stories being told. One told by the small body of American troops who were guarding the munitions train. The story they told was very straightforward. They had come under attack from werewolf insurgents. They had fought them off valiantly. 
to no avail. One of them had thrown a grenade. It had gotten into one of the munitions cars and exploded. Despite best efforts, the fire spread. The train was destroyed. And then Major Clark went and talked to some of the locals and heard a story that sounds far more likely. American soldiers, bored, guarding a train in the middle of nowhere, had built a small fire and were, for reasons known only to them and God, throwing munitions into the fire to see what would happen. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of bored 19-year-olds. <laughs> Somehow, this brilliant plan had gone awry, and the result had been the flattening of Oberriedenberg. In what can only be called a masterpiece of bureaucratic obfuscation, the official conclusion was that the cause of the fire was, quote, as yet undetermined. I say that, I start with that story, because I think it captures in a particularly brilliant way the chaos, the confusion, the questions that surrounded the American presence in Germany at the end of the Second World War. The story of the American occupation of Germany as one of the occupying powers in the wake of Nazism's collapse is by any standard a remarkable one and one that I will talk about with some degree of, I think, warranted admiration in this talk. But it was also one that was beset from the start by a particularly pervasive set of linked crises, which make the final result I think, all the more remarkable. So what I want to do in the 30 or so minutes that I intend to talk is to give a brief history of the occupation, and this is, is really just a gloss. Some of you will know far more about this. Some of you, for some of you, this is a necessary introduction. And then to talk about what I think is the most effective paradigm for viewing the experience of the American military occupation. And then to talk about three areas which I think are, are kind of unanswered questions or unexplored themes, themes that seem to beg further research, and themes that I suggest can be linked together to give us a richer, denser, and in some ways more useful picture of what the American mission on the Rhine was, what it was not, what it succeeded in doing, and what it failed to do. To begin with, I think it's useful to talk about dates. There is a formal period of American military occupation, which ends in 1949, but the story neither begins there nor ends there. The story of American troops on German soil is a much older one. There were American soldiers in the area around Koblenz in occupied Germany after the First World War. American soldiers distinguished themselves during that particular uh, end phase of the war uh, as being among the most, uh, being regarded as among the most uh, humane and, and I think respectful of the occupying troops. That was not hard to do compared to uh, the French who were certainly uh, much more concerned with avenging what had been for France a horrible and brutal conflict. But that is another story for another day. Serious planning for what was then understood to be a likely American presence on the ground in Central Europe began in 1943. Most crucially, it was planning not only for how to govern a conquered and defeated Germany, but also how to deal with the vast human costs of the war. I think one of the most important stories to come out of the planning phase for civil affairs in Central Europe was the creation in 1943 of an organization I don't have much time to talk about today that I think is of crucial importance, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, or UNRWA, the formation of which, despite problems that would be encountered in the displaced persons camps of occupied Europe, uh, would achieve remarkable results given the almost total lack of experience that anyone had with this kind of human catastrophe planning at the time. The first American boots stepped onto the soil of the Old Reich in September of 1944. And from then until April and May of 1945, the final campaigns, the crushing of the Reich, American military occupation unfolded across a vast part of the map. 
of Hitler's Reich. And it's important to remember that American occupation, Allied occupation, the conquest of Hitler's Germany happened across a spatial spectrum. There were parts of Germany that were occupied for much longer than other parts. Parts would not see foreign occupiers until the very end of the war. In some places, occupation was really quite mature in April and May of 1945. In others, it was just being instantiated. Perhaps the most formative document in terms of shaping American military policy in Germany, JCS 1067, was completed in April of 1945 and provided a kind of template outline for what was to come. Direct military occupation only lasted until the middle of 1946 with the establishment of an office of the military government, which saw itself, and I think this is really important for what comes next, as a body that had intentions toward civilianization. It may have been headed by an army general, but it had as its mandate the creation of an effective civilian administration in occupied Germany. I think that is absolutely foundational to the successes and the limits of what came next. And that formal occupation would end in the fall of 1949 with the establishment of a semi-sovereign federal republic of Germany. But of course, we know that the American military presence in Germany moved far beyond the limits of the four years of formal occupation. From 1944 until 1955, Foreign troops occupied, uh, exerted uh, an extraordinary degree of influence over developments on the ground in the western zones of Germany. It's a very different story in the east, though following a, a, a somewhat similar path. Until in 1955, West Germany emerged into something like full sovereignty and eventually NATO membership, rearmament, again, another story for another day. But I'm interested here in what I would call the long afterlife of the American occupation of Germany. The American occupation of Germany, which we could say, which we could define as 1944 to 1949 or 1944 to 1955, left a powerful intellectual legacy for American thinkers, American planners, American policymakers, and public intellectuals. Left a set of, of powerful legacies that continue, I think, to exert force to this day. Two of them that I would highlight in particular are the democratization paradigm and the empire paradigm. And I don't want to spend too much time on these, but they are, I think, worth reflecting on. I think there is a safe consensus among political scientists that the story of the American presence in West Germany and the creation of an independent, semi-sovereign and then sovereign federal republic is a remarkable and possibly almost entirely unique example of the successful democratization of a sovereign state by a foreign armed power. Pay and Casper in a Carnegie Institute study that was widely cited in 2003 one with obvious contemporary relevance to what was going on at that time, called the story of the Americans in West Germany one of the few unambiguous successes in an otherwise sobering record. I think this democratization paradigm to which I'll come back to in a moment is important, it's persuasive, but it has very real limits. The other paradigm that I wanted to talk about, the empire paradigm, is somewhat older, in fact, you can date its earliest exponents from the time of the occupation itself, when John McCloy, the first Allied High Commissioner in Germany, described the task of his predecessor, General Lucius Clay, as being, quote, the nearest thing to a Roman proconsulship that the modern world could afford. The thing about the empire paradigm is that it works. There is no question that the American military occupation occupied a, a, a role in the rebuilding of, West, of Western Germany that could best be described as proconsular. But it also doesn't work because it gets entangled in this loaded word empire. 
that is so problematic in talking about America's role in the broader world. So problematic, in fact, that subsequently scholars and policymakers and, and public intellectuals have been trying to think about ways to modify that word empire so it doesn't sound so empire-y. Christopher Sanders called this a leasehold empire. Geir Lundestadt had an even nicer version of this, an empire by invitation. And more recently, Lisa Hoffman has decided to scrap the word entirely and get something that's awfully close and call this American umpire. <laughs> anyway, an interesting new book, possibly worth reading. So we've now quibbled with the word empire. That's a word we don't particularly like, and there are good reasons for this. There's lots of genuine empires in this world. We should know them when we see them. Colonialism is a thing. It is a historical agent. It is something that we can continue to debate in this world. But getting the story of the Americans in West Germany tangled up in that, I think, has real limits. And there is, but, so I want to return to this idea of democratization. There is no question in my mind that democratization as an outcome of the American presence in Western Germany in the years after the Second World War is important. And if you look at what was going on on the ground in some of these communities, it is almost mind boggling how successful the experiment of local institution building, local democracy promotion was in parts of the American occupation zone. One of the most staggering facts of the occupation to me is that in 1946 alone, so grand total of 18 months after the end of the war, voters in the, what's today the state of Bavaria, most of the American zone of occupation, voted in not one, not two, but three reasonably free fair multi-party elections. They voted for local councils, they voted for state parliaments, and they voted for a state constitutional body. Given that this was a state that was just months removed from a devastating war, which had been visited upon the rest of Europe and then visited back upon Germany, I find that fact absolutely remarkable. But it's not enough. The democratization paradigm offers us a window into the broader transformation engendered under American and Western occupation. But it's not nearly enough because I think it fails to capture the fundamental complexity of what the Americans found when they got to Germany. And that's something I'm going to talk about for much of the rest of the lecture. I don't want to give political scientists too much credit. They take plenty. <laughs> but I think the political scientists are on to something. When they talk about this concept, or they develop this literature of the failed and failing state, and there is an enormous literature on this that some of you in this room may be quite familiar with this. It's a vast literature that often disagrees with itself, but the best way that I could summarize it is that the literature on state failure focuses on the ability or inability of states to exercise sovereign functions within Westphalian norms. Sovereign functions within Westphalian norms. Basically, can a state act like a state? There is, in some of this literature, a nod to the idea that it might be useful to think about American occup or to think about the Nazi regime at its very end as a failed or failing state. But it's not properly contextualized. And this is where I think political scientists and historians could have a really productive conversation. Because the assumption that political scientists often make about the failure of Nazi Germany is that Nazi Germany failed because it was defeated. Those of us who work on the late phases of the Nazi period particularly the brutal years of 1944 and 1945 when it was clear that the war had turned inexorably and irreversibly against Germany, it becomes clear that Nazi Germany did not fail because it was defeated. It failed while it was being defeated. The Americans and their allies did not cause state failure. They participated in state failure. 
And that's really, really important, I think, for what comes next. Obviously, I'm not here to talk about Nazi Germany, but I want to talk about four areas in particular that I think both char characterize what we today call failed states and what you can see in Hitler's Germany in the 18 months before the end of the war. First, the German economy in 1944 and 45 was in free fall, particularly at the end of 1944 into 45. Inflation had reduced the cash economy to all, the formal economy, to all but a trickle. German GDP per capita would peak in 1944 and then collapse precipitously at the end of that year in, er, into early 1945. One of the, the images that we have of economic life in post-war Germany is the black marketeer. The black market networks that flourished in American and Western occupied Germany were not new in 1945. They were the descendants of black market networks that had developed during the end phases of the Nazi state. Germans didn't need to learn to be black marketeers in 1945. They already knew. And much of the literature that we now have on German society during the war certainly confirms this. Second, the public health system was in the process of a spectacular collapse with absolutely horrible results. Infant mortality in Germany at the beginning of 1945, according to one historian of public health, is almost exactly comparable to infant mortality in today's Democratic Republic of Congo. This was a state that was increasingly unable to provide basic needs for its population. There is no question that state institutions in 1944 and 1945 were becoming far more brutal, far less moored to whatever tendentious rule of law had existed previously. There are many examples. Here's one. Historians who've looked at the Gestapo in rural central Germany came, have, have long known that in late 1944 and early 1945, trials for, uh, of foreign forced laborers for sexu having sexual relationships with German women almost completely stopped. Early assumptions were that Gestapo agents simply weren't interested in prosecuting these sorts of cases anymore. In fact, the truth is far grimmer. They just stopped having trials and were conducting kangaroo courts out in the field and often imposing death sentences at the time. And then finally, and something I'm going to come back to in a few minutes to talk about in uh, some more detail, Germany had lost control over its borders. Vast flows of refugees, both leaving the bomb-ravaged cities and, most importantly, coming into the shrinking borders of Hitler's imperium, were, by early 1945, a fundamental threat to public order for which there was no useful response from the state. So that's the framework into which I suggest the Americans came. <clears throat> not one that was created when the Americans came. And that's a story that I'm now going to tease out. And I talk about three aspects of this story that, again, I think are important, that need to be understood in the context of this narrative of state failure and the rebuilding of institutions, and that I think point the way toward a fuller understanding of this remarkable story. The first is what I would call the search for partners. Next slide, please. The search for partners. If you survey the literature on the American occupation of Germany, you will find one idea repeated more or less ad nauseum, that one of the great successes of the American occupation was that it found German partners with whom to work. This, I think, takes a necessity and turns it into a virtue. The American quest for partners in post-war Germany was not the result of a desire to prop up German civilian institutions for the purpose of propping up German civilian institutions. It was an absolute necessity. And here I want to point, out, point to this slide uh, in part because it's really dramatic and in part because it highlights some of the important themes that we're talking about, not just in this part of the lecture, but later on. We see in 1945 more than 1.8 million American military personnel on the ground in Germany. This drops off 
remarkably into 1946 for reasons that are fairly obvious. These numbers stay fairly consistent. We're going to come back to this because obviously there's going to be a bit of a spike in the early 1950s, a story that we'll tell later on. We see the civilianization of the, of the American occupation with the arrival of family members who begin to play a more proportional role in, uh, in, this, in this chart. The American military government, much like uh, the American presence in general, had what can only be called a remarkably tiny footprint. There were never more than 12,000 American military personnel working in military government detachments at, at any given time. 12,000. This is for a population of something like 50 million people. And even that is somewhat more complicated, as I'll get to later on. Just as an example, the district that I have written about uh, in my book, uh, the district of Landkreis Brückenau, this is a, well, not a district, the county of Landkreis Brückenau, that is, Landkreis is a rural county, warranted the smallest possible military government detachment. That is, four officers and four enlisted men. Landkreis Brückenau had a population of about 35,000 people, roughly 20% of whom were ethnic German refugees. And on top of that was home to the largest camp for displaced persons anywhere in Europe, the massive Polish displaced persons camp at Wildflecken, which had at its height about 20,000 people in it. The entire American administrative apparatus in Landkreis Brückenau was eight men, four of them officers. One of them, Major Clark, uh, had been a journalist in civilian life. One was a career serviceman. Another was an engineer. And the last was an oil field equipment salesman. None of them spoke a word of German, much less Polish. And in fact, according to one fairly comprehensive study of the phenomenon, at most 5% of Americans working in military government detachments spoke enough German that they rated that they could carry on a conversation in the language. I suspect the number is actually a lot lower than that. In the case of Landkreis Brückenau, the, ability of, uh, the inability of anybody to speak Polish proved to be a huge problem given that there were 20,000 Poles living in the county. And it wasn't until the counterintelligence corps showed up in the person of a first generation Ukrainian immigrant who incidentally saw that I was working on this book on the internet and called me one day at work, um, which really surprised the heck out of me. The entire Polish speaking apparatus in Landkreis Brückenau was a guy named Chester Wolkanowski, uh, who's currently retired and living in San Diego. But that's another story. The American quest for partners in this context was not something that was seen as a good, it was something that was seen as a necessity. And here again, we have a, a story that calls into question the singularity of this kind of democratization paradigm. Because the fundamental fact on the ground was that these people existed. This was a context in which there had been a dictatorship for 12 years, but prior to that, a rough and tumble but functioning democracy, a relatively free press. The reformation of, polit of, of formal political life was surprisingly easy. That doesn't mean it was easy. It just means it was easier than you might think. Journalism is another really good example. If you needed an editor for a journal or for a newspaper, as they did in uh, well, across the American zone, when the new licenses were being issued in the summer of 1945, it was relatively unproblematic to find journalists with acceptable political leanings. In some cases, they'd been to prison. In others, they'd simply retired in 1933, or they'd gone into near exile. These people existed. They were willing partners. Many of them spoke English. But they were also absolutely necessary. Because at no point was the American occupation government actually able to carry on the functions that it set out for itself without these partners. We cannot make the mistake of turning necessity into virtue. The second point that I want to make is that if we study the American occupation at the level of policy, 
whether that's policy coming from Washington, that's coming from the Office of the Military Government of the United States, or even that's coming at the, the level of the sort of German state capitals. We miss something very important that in part for the reasons I just outlined, there was a growing and large gap between policy and practice on the ground. And there is perhaps no place where we can see this more clearly than on the issue of refugees, which is something that I just touched on uh, a few moments ago. Very, very briefly, there were three kinds of refugees, effectively, in post-war Germany. There were the displaced persons, citizens of allied nations who found themselves homeless or separated from their country after the war. Millions of them, something like, something like 17 million at one point, though that number would decrease very, very quickly as Western European displaced persons went home. But many displaced persons didn't go home and they formed the so-called hardcore who would often live in displaced persons camps into the late 1940s or early 1950s. There were also homeless Germans, the so-called evacuierte, who fled from Germany's bomb-ravaged cities and needed some place to go. And then there were the massive inflows of ethnic German refugees from the east, the so-called expellees, who fled or were forced to flee from their homes in central and east central Europe as the tide of war turned against Germany. It is these last two categories that I'm particularly interested in because officially American policy toward these refugees was that they were a German problem. Displaced persons were an allied problem. These were United Nations recognized displaced persons. But as the only real monographic study, which was written by a faculty member at one of the German uh, Bundeswehr universities, has shown very clearly the Americans at, at policy level showed what can only be called a remarkable disinterest in the fate of ethnic German expellees and German evacuees until at least 1947, when for a whole host of reasons, many of them having to do with the Cold War, American policy began to shift toward a more thorough reconstruction of political and social life in Western Germany. But if you look at conditions on the ground, you see that things could often be remarkably different. And there's no better example of this than the, I think, really quite extraordinary story of what was going on in the city of Würzburg, which would become a major, an American division headquarters, a major garrison city not far from the border between the two Germanys. In 1948, Würzburg got a new, uh, the Würzburg military post got a new commander, Brigadier General Louis Beebe, whose career through the Second World War is, I think, in some ways quite extraordinary. Beebe had been in the Philippines when the war broke out. He was Wainwright's chief of staff on Corregidor, He'd be taken prisoner, and would spend the rest of the war in a series of Japanese POW camps. He would finally be liberated in April 1945 in Manchuria. He returned briefly to the United States, but desperately wanted to continue to play a part. So he was sent to Germany in 1948, where he became, as I said, the commander of the Würzburg military post, where he would remain until 1950. For health reasons, he came back to the United States and died shortly thereafter. He never recovered from the stresses of his imprisonment. But he brought with him an equally remarkable person, his wife, Dorothy. Dorothy Beebe who had just endured her husband's captivity, came to Würzburg, looked out at a devastated landscape, looked out at the 20% of the population who were refugees, mostly expellees from the East, and said, we have to do something about it. Her, husband, her husband's hands were tied, hers were not. She and the American Wives Club organized clothing drives charitable donations, drawing largely on uh, her oldest relationship, that with her hometown of Faribault, Minnesota, which began supplying large numbers of boxes of clothing, toiletries, etc., to the refugees, the evacuees, the expellees living in the city of Würzburg. It is kind of a remarkable relationship. It continues to this day. Würzburg and Faribault are sister cities. Had the opportunity to meet up with the sister city committees from both places. It really is kind of a, a fascinating little afterthought to the story of the American presence in Germany. But this points, I think, to something quite, something much larger. That particularly with the arrival of dependents, 
with the creation of a more civilian face to the American military occupation, the suffering of ordinary Germans became, if not a front burner issue for policymakers, a front burner issue for those who were on the ground confronting this massive degree of human suffering in the streets of places like Würzburg. And those relationships could deepen and spin off in all sorts of different ways. Something I someday want to sick a graduate student on because I don't want to do it myself. Um, as I was looking through the records from the early 1950s of American soldiers who wanted to marry German women, I discovered, in the, this is in the, the area around Kitzingen over about a three year period, I discovered what I consider to be a fairly notable 300% statistical overrepresentation of expellee women marrying American soldiers. This is not, on the face of it, terribly surprising. These were people who arrived in Germany in 1944 and 1945, penniless, having lost everything with very little possibility of ever going back to the place from which they came. They saw lifelines. They met eligible young men who had come to Germany for different purposes. And it is a fundamentally human and fundamentally American story. The story of a refugee washing up penniless in a strange land, but whose journey doesn't end there, whose journey ends in Buffalo, New York, or Cleveland, Ohio, or any number of other places where they might have ended up. But the key thing here in, as a research question is that as far as the Americans were concerned, these women were Germans. Although if you look at that crucial bl uh, blank on their marriage application, place of birth, you all too often see places that weren't Germany in 1936. You see Romania, you see Czechoslovakia, you see Poland. You see places that had German minorities in the 1930s that didn't have them anymore in the 1940s. But again, at a policy level, these women were German. But if you read quite literally between the lines, you see a much more fascinating story of the unweaving of Central Europe and how the Americans stepped into that. And then finally, and I want to talk about this fairly briefly at the last slide. And finally, I think it's worth thinking about the American military occupation in terms of what came next. Because, and I think this is fairly crucial, it gets back to some of the things I was just talking about. I don't think we can understand the important transition from occupation to semi-sovereignty, and we cannot understand the very crucial buildup of American military forces in West Germany in the 1950s without understanding it in the context of the other things that I just finished talking about. The numbers are fairly remarkable in their own light. In 1950, the year after that first chart I showed stopped, there were only about 80,000 American military personnel in Western Germany. By the end of 1951, that number had gone up to 252,000. And the reason for this is obvious. The outbreak of the Korean War in June of 1950, the transition of four American divisions to West Germany. The Korea boom, which had profound implications for the economy in Western Germany, has been sometimes called a second Marshall Plan, though it was fairly closely tied to the first Marshall Plan. All of this is obviously of crucial importance, but it's too often treated as being basically divorced from what happened in 1949. And some of you uh, who are researching historians will know this. I think there's actually a very good reason why historians uh, divide uh, 1949 so rigidly from 1950. And that is because if you're in the National Archives, you quite literally have to get up on the military side, walk about 20 feet, and sit down on the civilian side, all of a sudden in the middle of the fall of 1914. I would argue that that 20-foot walk has prevented a really good comprehensive history of the Americans in post-war West Germany from being written. And that's really not saying anything good about the general physical fitness of the profession of historians. But that's neither here nor there. I have a doctoral student, Scott Bertinetti, who's currently at the Army War College, who's working on this. So I'm very much hoping that in a couple of years I can talk about how Scott's dissertation solves all these problems and I don't need to talk about it anymore. But if you, again, if you look at what was happening on the ground, you see how closely these periods are linked. In the immediate emergency after, 19, after June of 1950, when it appeared to a bunch of very smart people that there was some likelihood that a land war would start in Central Europe, 
The Americans rushed into Western Germany with all they could at that moment. And this is a story that's been told much better by other people. This required space. And in the last six months of 1950, the Americans requisitioned 56 former Wehrmacht and, uh, and, and Reichswehr military installations across Western Germany. The thing of it is, most of these places were already occupied. They were occupied by refugees. If you want to understand what forced the West German government to begin to try to solve its refugee problem, the persistent problems that it had inherited when it became sovereign, semi-sovereign in 1949, much of it has to do with precisely this process. It has to do with the fact that there were just enough refugee camps to keep a, enough of these refugees housed effectively until all of a sudden those camps became of great interest to the American military in its efforts to reposition itself for what was feared to come. It is not an accident that these requisitions, which went through 1950 and 1951, were followed not long thereafter by a massive building project. And you can see this. I love this image here. We have a nameless American officer addressing a really glum looking group of Germans <laughs> at the building of new apartment blocks, which were built partly with Marshall Plan money for expellees who had been living in a refugee camp that was then cleared in 1950 by the Americans. Some of you may know it, the Galgenberg, uh, uh, the skyline complex uh, above the city of Würzburg. These are the apartments that were built for the people who had been there and then were driven off of that property in 1950 when the Americans came to take it uh, and build what would become a division headquarters and a key part of the American defense architecture for West Germany. So where does this leave us? After talking for some minutes about the tragedy that had befallen Germany, largely of its own making, the massive, almost indescribable social, political, moral, economic, military collapse that the Americans found when they got to Germany in 1949. In 19, sorry, in 1944. I sound like my students. Uh, the war didn't begin in 1949. Thank you. All right. Um, what I think we can see here, and the way that I would argue that we need to think about how the Americans arrived in Germany, how they built in Germany, and how they stayed in Germany, is that this was a period of extraordinary dynamic interactivity that took place at all levels. We cannot understand how a West German government came to function without understanding how it functioned vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. We cannot understand how the West German government negotiated what would become the Status of Forces Agreement in 1951 without understanding the complex and dynamic interplay between the needs of the semi-sovereign West German state to house refugees and the needs of the Americans to rush troops in to prevent or potentially win a land war in Central Europe. We cannot understand the human tragedy that befell Central Europe in the 1940s without understanding the path that was taken out of that. And we cannot fundamentally understand the building of a successful, prosperous, and free society in the shadow of Hitler's Reich without understanding the complex, fraught, sometimes quite violent process that brought us from devastation and destruction toward something new, toward a workable society in the shadow of the Reich, toward a new relationship between the United States and Germany, one that continues to this day. Thank you very much. Questions, Happy to take questions. Please. please. Um, very interesting presentation. I was in Germany three different times during that occupation. Uh, but beg the question of how was it different in the British and French occupation? Well, I think there's, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question and, and a big one. Um, I think part of this has to do with uh, what the intention of the occupation zones really was. I mean, broadly speaking, the fundamental underlying goal of the British was occupa uh, occupation uh, was to not be occupying Germany anymore, to get out in as quick 
and cost-effective a way as humanly possible. It's why the British were so eager uh, for the bizonal fusion with the Americans. The story of the French occupation of Germany is a fascinating one, and it is quite literally one where there are still lots of documents we haven't seen yet. There is lots and lots of evidence that the French occupation, particularly in 1945 and 46, was very, very brutal. And I, I think it's safe to say that the French uh, suffered enough military embarrassments during that period. They're not eager to start to <coughs> make another one too public. So they've actually managed to pretty well keep a lid on a lot of the documents from their occupation zone, um, which is kind of fascinating if you think about it, particularly related to refugees. Um, the most notable difference between the American and the French zones in the context that I'm talking about is that the French were utterly uninterested in taking in refugees of any kind and made strenuous efforts to make sure that if refugees came into the French zone, they were pushed out. So the French essentially washed their hands of the whole thing. Their justification was, we've just suffered German occupation. Uh, we're not going to take care of any Germans. Thank you very much. So you know, in, in the British, actually, uh, particularly the area around Schleswig-Holstein, actually had a slightly higher proportion of ethnic German refugees. Uh, the French had almost none at all. Yes, please. I presume that in, uh, you know, thinking about the chart you showed of the, the personnel levels, I presume that in 1945, 46, there's a dramatic drop in the percentage of occupation forces who had experienced combat and direct contact with Nazi Germany. So what impact did that shift have on uh, the attitudes and activities of American personnel on the ground. Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is is probably yes, but it's hard to it's it's hard to determine. I mean, you, there's no question that that people like Major Clark uh, had only come into the theater at the end. I mean, Major Clark was a he was one of the original civil affairs. Uh, he finished civil affairs school in 1943. He'd been in uh, he'd been in France. Uh, as part of the of, of uh, civil affairs there, and then had ended up in Germany. So you're right. This is someone who had not seen a tremendous amount of of direct military action uh, at the end of the war. Uh, a little bit difficult to say. I mean, I, it's all anecdotal, but I, I would point to people like you know Louis Beebe, who if you if you wanted to find someone who had good reason to be fairly vindictive, um, he's the guy. Um, and yet, what we see is, to a remarkable degree, I think, a, a sense of this is a human tragedy that's unfolding here. And it really was. Uh, the, the condition that ordinary Germans, the, the, the German word is Einheimische, there's no, the sort of locals, um, uh, but particularly the refugees, it was very, very hard to turn away from that. And I, I think that had a powerful impact humanizing the Germans for a, an occupation force that, that could have responded in a very different way. Uh, thinking about uh, in Germany at the time and in all of post-war Europe, I mean, it, what tremendous stresses the society is under, you know, so it's hard for us to imagine sometimes, and as with the refugees and displaced persons, there's still a lot of flow going on. As you look through the documents, how much of a sense do you think that the uh, either the military or the civilian administrators of Germany understood a lot of the currents as the society and the economy and every and all these other different parts were were coming together the, the political uh, aspects um, and do they have a good sense for what was going on on the ground uh, yeah sure I mean I think it was the, the, I'm gonna punt on this it was getting there um, you know there was a there was a certainly uh, I, I mean I think uh, if you look back at, at much of the literature on refugee management, which certainly focuses on the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, um, there is this sense that UNRWA was, was this kind of bumbling organization that didn't really know what it was doing and, and managed to kind of get in the way. Uh, certainly a number of key people in the American military government thought so. But I would say on the whole, given the millions and millions of people that they were trying to serve, given the conditions that they had and the limitations they had, that's actually a remarkable success story that this didn't go a lot worse. Um, there's, there's no question that, I mean, I mean, one of the interesting things ab about this is that we now think of refugee management as being something that there are institutions, there are institutions that do this, 
There are refugee management specialists at the NGO level, through the United Nations, USAID. I mean, take your pick. Um, none of this existed in, in 1943. Um, there were a few people who had experience with refugees from the Spanish Civil War, but they had a problem because they were often, um, particularly for the Americans, politically untrustworthy because they were associated with the Republicans. So some of the only, that is the Republicans in Spain, um, they, were, they were some of the only people who had any direct experience were actually being kept out of the field. So essentially, UNRWA was making it up as they went along. They were also dependent for 60% of their budget and even more than that in their supplies from the Americans. And so that relationship between UNRWA, which uh, had standing as an organization within the, the alliance, and the Americans was, was very, very important. And despite the fact that there are lots of glaring screw-ups, I think on the whole, it has to be chalked up as a, as a pretty remarkable accomplishment that the process worked at all. Were there any guidelines specifically related to um, uh, ethnic minorities and their ability to go home, or, or was, was there? Yeah, this is, a, this is a really complicated question because in 1945, the, the designation that you became a United Nations displaced person meant that you were a, a, a citizen of an allied country who, for reasons, was, was away from your home against their will. And uh, the, the massive, just, to, just one statistic that really helps capture this. The German economy in 1944 and 1945 ran on foreign labor. Whether this was forced, coerced, or something in between, it varied. 26% of all adults working in Nazi Germany in 1944 were foreign laborers. The entire economy was keyed toward foreign labor. In some sectors, it was over 60%. A lot of these people were either, and this gets really complicated, and this has direct bearing on what we're talking about today, um, were Poles or Ukrainians. And of course, the border between Poland and Ukraine had moved, and so, if you were a Ukrainian, even if you'd been Polish in 1939, you suddenly faced the prospect of forced repatriation in 1945. Forced repatriation was horrible. The British did it in Austria, the Americans did some of it, and very quickly abandoned it. But this required this sort of odd shift where Ukrainians, who were not considered to be their own national group because they were Soviets, were now considered their own national group in late 1945, early 1946. That is actually a key moment in the, in the slow uh, degradation of the relationship between the Americans and the Soviets. This happened across the board. It happened in the case of Yugoslavia, uh, Serbs, Croats, the question of, of who was in power in Belgrade, who had legitimate refugee status. Um, it, it was suddenly very good to be Polish, um, although there were lots of people who were born in Poland who were now who now found themselves against their will citizens of the Ukraine. Uh, it, is a, it is a terrifically complicated story, and, and it's part of what makes this such an a absolute unholy mess uh, in practice in 1945, because there were not a lot of Americans who wanted to get involved in distinguishing between Poles and Ukrainians. Uh, you get some of these guidelines, um, you, know, you ask about, about kind of this at the level of policy, you get guidelines like, look for people who have Ukrainian names. That wasn't very helpful. Anyway, yes, it's a great question and one I can't in any way do justice to in the time we have. Please. Uh, doctor, can you draw some parallels between the occupation of Germany and the occupation of Iraq? Like, were the lesson learned from Germany applied in Iraq or not? Now, I'm also going to punt on that question because I know really little about Iraq. Um, but, but I, I, I want to point to one very, very important difference, and that is the the this, this kind of retiree phenomenon. That is that the, the Nazi dictatorship lasted for 12 years. There were lots of people who were able to, in 1933, step away from their jobs, willingly or unwillingly, go into effectively internal exile, keep their heads down, make it through the war, and then re-emerge and essentially do their old jobs. Konrad Adenauer is perhaps the best example. This was a guy who was the mayor of a major West, Western German city who essentially, as he put it, tended his roses for 12 years and then re-emerged as a viable, if very, very old politician. You had the same thing happening in journalism. You had the same thing happen to some extent in, in you know, some areas of kind of local political life. Teachers were a bit of a problem, but this group existed and they could re-emerge in 1945. 
And I think that, that in the context of understanding denazification and its limits, we have to keep that in mind. Very, very different than what happens in societies that have had multi-decade experiences with di dictatorship. But again, the amount I know about Iraq could be put on a very small piece of paper. So I, 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 I can't guarantee that's it. Yes, please. The, um, the security concerns for the American forces after the war, as, that, as the numbers dropped from over a million down to a couple hundred thousand, they're still in a hostile environment. Still have a lot of ex-Nazis around. So, well, can you kind of give us an idea? How secure was that for the U.S. forces to be there? Yeah, that's a, that's. A, thank you for asking that. I, I started this uh, with the story of a of a. a accidental explosion that was blamed by the people who were probably responsible for causing it on werewolf gorillas. The werewolf gorillas are a great story. Um, I'm going to paraphrase the Italian writer Umberto Eco and say that uh, the werewolves were everywhere, aided immeasurably by the fact that they didn't exist. Um, they show up across the, uh, I mean, they, across the occupation zones, but particularly in the American zone, um, as this sort of constant phantom menace but they didn't really do they didn't really exist and they didn't really do anything there was very very little armed resistance that said and and i think this is easy to miss this was also a society that had an extraordinary amount of access to weapons weapons that had been left behind by the german army as it fell apart um and this you know this happens in a couple of ways it happens uh from kind of conscious pilfering of German military supplies. It happens when soldiers just took their weapon with them when they went home. And so I, I think that in terms of day-to-day of -day security of American military personnel, there was very little threat. But there was a real concern about the presence of, of personal weapons and an effort by American law enforcement, the, particularly the constabulary, to find and confiscate weapons. This became particularly problematic in rural areas where not only was there a tradition of hunting, but you needed weapons to keep deer and boar out of the crops. And so this, this was actually, I mean, I, I don't mean to, to bring everything back to the reinstitution of local politics, but if you look at what local political units out in the countryside were doing in late 1945 and 1946, one of the primary uh, points of negotiation with the Americans was licensing for, for personal weapons. People wanted to hunt again. Um, so I, I think that you know, it's, it was a relatively safe environment, but it wasn't perceived to be, certainly in 1945 and 1946. One more question, please. Yeah, there, there were several. Uh operation plans, post-war uh, occupation plans put together. Uh, it started during the war and then uh, they were implemented after the war to, to varying degrees. Do you have any uh, knowledge about how well they were actually put together then subsequently implemented? Yeah, that's a great question and it's it's one that I'm, I'm, I'm not terrifically well positioned to answer, but I, I think that, that you know, there are, as you say, there are a number of plans that are often contradictory. Uh, there are questions about the basic goals of the, uh, of what the multi, the four power occupation is going to be. One really terrific example of this uh, is the so-called, the so-called Morgenthau plan, probably the best known plan for the post-war uh, reconstruction of, of Germany. And this is a, this is a really fascinating case study because this came from the American Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. Um, and, and involved what was called a pastoralization of Germany. That is, reduce its industrial, it's a lovely word, pastoralization, which means take away all their industry and make them farmers again. Um, and one of the interesting uh, kind of, uh, I, I guess, legacies of this is that uh, the story of the Morgenthau Plan is almost always told as the Morgenthau Plan was there, but it was way too harsh. And so in the end, it was scrapped because it was just too punitive. I actually think there's something much more interesting going on, which is that um, the Morgenthau plan became impossible when it became entirely clear that the Soviets were going to give a huge chunk of eastern Germany, where much of the farmland is, to Poland, uh, and we're going to occupy the rest. At that point, you can't pastoralize the country because there isn't enough farmland to feed the people who are there. Now, in a way, the Morgenthau Plan, the, 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 the story of the Morgenthau Plan is almost always told as it was too brutal, so it was abandoned. In fact, it was too lenient. 
um, it, it, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was giving the Germans uh, uh, territory that they weren't actually going to have in the wake of the war. Uh, but, but this speaks, I think, to a, a, a fundamental issue, which is that really until the, the occupation started, it wasn't quite clear what the overall strategic goal for, uh, for a, a reconstructed German polity would be, aside from the one thing everyone could agree on, which is that Germany was not going to be a threat again. And let's keep in mind, this seems rather elementary, but it happens to be true. In the previous 70 years, Germany had been responsible for starting three really big wars. They'd only won one of them, and that was the French in 1870 and 1871. So need, you didn't have to do, work very hard to convince the French that Germany needed to be neutered. Um, the question was just what the best way to do that was that would create a stable entity in the center of Europe. Okay, on behalf of uh, Dr. Mahan, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Thanks. Thanks for a presentation. Thank you very much.